I'm, I'm just going to get started. Um, I'm really happy that uh, we, today we have Dania Francis uh, in our seminar series. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, she was at UMass Amherst before. Uh, her PhD is from Duke. Um, her work is from, on racial economic disparities, the economics of education, and certification economics. She's published papers in outlets like Science, the American Economic Review, and the Review of Black Political Economy. Um, so over to you, Dania. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me just go in and share my PowerPoint. There we are. Okay, so this is, uh, I'll say this is joint work with um, Angela de Oliveira and uh, Carrie Dimmitt, both at UMass Amherst. Um, Angela in the uh, Resource Economics Department at UMass Amherst and Carrie Dimmitt in the um, uh, College of Education. Uh, she's a school counselor, um, educator and researcher. So our question today, we are interested in this question of whether or not school counselors exhibit bias in recommending students for advanced courses. Why does this matter? Well, Blacks in the US are underrepresented in STEM fields. In particular, in this paper, we're gonna be looking at advanced placement calculus, which is one of these gateway uh, courses to getting access to um, uh, STEM majors in college um, and, and more broadly uh, uh, STEM careers. So um, we are, some may ask, you know, why do advanced placement classes matter in particular? And I found this um, uh, comic that I thought was um, indicative of a lot of the feeling about how advanced placement classes have become so much more ubiquitous um, over the course of the past um, couple decades. Um, there's been an expansion of them. And so some people may ask, you know, um, you know, why do we need advanced courses? What are they doing? What purpose are they serving? Um, and so what does the research say? Well, some of the research has demonstrated that students in advanced placement courses, and just to, I, I, I recognize I do this a lot. I assume everyone knows what advanced placement courses are. Let me pause a second and say, right, advanced placement courses are, um, um, in, in particular, the AP system is um, a system where students get um, enriched education in particular um, subjects. Um, and you can uh, take an exam at the end to demonstrate your mastery of the knowledge. And a lot of times performance on that exam is used to give you college credit for having already taken those courses at a college level, right? So, so in a sense, there are real <clears throat> benefits um, if you take and do well in the courses and pass the exams. Um, but research indicates that there are also benefits that accrue whether or not you even take the exam and get these <clears throat> um, college credit benefits. Right? And some of those benefits include access to more effective teachers, um, improved academic performance, increased likelihood of even attending a four-year college, uh, increased access to beneficial social networks, um, improved behavioral outcomes. And in particular, um, there's, uh, it's been shown that improvement in math outcomes for minority students is linked to better longer-term life outcomes. Right? So, 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 Presence and access to these courses have you know, real um, consequences and they matter. And so we should be concerned that there appears to be a underrepresentation of Blacks and Hispanics in uh, these courses um, and an overrepresentation relative to their public school population of Asian students and white students. <clears throat> and so that's what I'm showing you here, data from 2015, 2016. The most recent data available are now the 2017-2018 uh, data, which were released a few months ago at the end of 2020, um, but they don't look a lot different, right? So this is showing you the difference between advanced placement course enrollment percentage and the percentage of public school pop of the public school population. And what we can see is that um, the disparities are larger for science and math courses. Um, as opposed to this other category, which includes things like, you know, AP Spanish, AP World History, um, um, uh, any number of, of, of courses um, other than those that fit into the, the science and math categories. Okay, and so we see this um, underrepresentation, and we can ask, what causes this, right? What explains the under enrollment of even academically eligible Black students in advanced courses? 
right? So even when we look at the population of students who are you know, technically eligible to take these courses because they've done well in um, their prior academic record. Um, so this again, abstracts away from the fact that there are lots of black and Hispanic students who um, um, arrive at the point of high school and the possibility of taking advanced courses who are not um, academically up to it, um, um, possibly because of their prior preparation, right? So even those who arrive academically eligible, we see this underrepresentation. What explains this? So research um, seeking to answer this question has often paralleled the litter on explanations for the persistent Black-White test score gap. Right, so we can think of this as another achievement gap, right? So not just test scores, but also um, participation in advanced courses as another manifestation of academic achievement gaps. Okay, and so um, um, in this literature, we've seen both cultural and structural arguments be put forth. And we can think of these in terms of um, in economics lingo, um, possibly you know, underinvestment on the culture side. Why are Black and Hispanic students um, choosing, right, if it's a cultural uh, choice um, uh, to underinvest versus are there some constraints on their choice, their ability to make those um, uh, decisions to join advanced placement courses? Okay, so the cultural arguments, um, those who make cultural arguments theorize that Black students may have less motivation or less of an academic orientation, in part because they fear being accused of, quote, acting white by their Black peers, right? This argument is typically undergirded by Ogbu's oppositional culture theory, which posits that Blacks, as an involuntary minority in the U.S., perceive structural barriers in society, such as employment and wage discrimination, as inhibiting their life chances for successful life outcomes. As coping mechanisms, Blacks then adopt this oppositional culture stance, devaluing attitudes and behaviors that typify the dominant culture, such as studying hard, speaking properly, dressing in a preppy manner. Right? And so although many researchers have since tested and failed to find support for this oppositional culture theory, it continues to resurface as an explanation for differences in black and white academic out outcomes. Structural arguments, on the other hand, include differences in prior academic preparation, the differential likelihood of teachers and academic counselors to encourage similarly qualified black versus white high school students to take advanced coursework and prepare for college, uh, racial wealth disparities that lead to differences in access to resources that make AP, course, AP courses less intimidating, like outside tutoring, um, and lack of access to social circles where students and parents trade knowledge on the best courses to take. Okay. And so why does it matter whether the explanation is um, you know, cultural or structural or some com combination of the two? Well, it matters because the policy solutions are very different, right, depending on um, uh, what you think the source is. If you think <clears throat> the explanation is cultural, you're more likely to support initiatives um, like My Brother's Keeper, right? Mentoring programs, um, programs that tend to center on fixing what it is that's wrong, right? With, with this cultural um, attitude that's keeping, uh, causing these children to underinvest, underinvest in their education, children and parents, by the way. Um, but if the explanation is even partly structural, then all of the behavioral interventions in the world won't fully address the gap, right? And in fact, it can even be more harmful to underrepresented students who have, quote, done everything right, but still don't achieve at the level of their white peers, right? So if you're telling, if you're telling Black students this is behavioral and it's cultural and they need mentor programs to, to do the right things and, um, and fix it, and yet they're still facing these barriers, um, um, it can be very detrimental. And so what I will and won't try to do today. So what I won't try to do, I won't try to convince you that there's little or no merit to, to the cultural explanations for academic achievement gaps. I think that's something to talk for another day. Um, but what I will try to do is convince you that um, there are structural barriers that are preventing some underrepresented students from taking AP courses. And therefore policy solutions that are uh, only address these cultural um, arguments will miss the mark. So what do we do in this paper? So in this paper, it's an um, experimental paper, um, um, an audit study. Um, and audit studies in the past have been used to investigate discrimination in labor markets, real estate markets, consumer markets, 
um, one of the more uh, well-known um, correspondence audit studies is the Bertrand and um, Nathan 2004 paper, um, uh, which looked, was a resume audit study um, where they sent out, uh, you know, fictitious resumes to um, uh, actual uh, employment advertisements. Um, and the only thing that they changed on the resume were the names at the top. Right, and so the, the paper is called, right, are Emily and Greg, you know, more employable than Lakeisha or Jamal or something to that nature. And so what they do find is that the names that are more indicative of um, uh, white potential employee, employees, Emily and Greg, were much more likely to get callbacks for the jobs than Lakeisha and Jamal, which were signifying um, uh, black potential employees, right? And so we're using that um, correspondence audit study um, uh, uh, design, we're adapting it to um, look at school counselors likelihood of recommending students based on academic transcripts. Okay, and so um, what we did is um, we, we constructed a survey. Um, and in particular, our school counselor uh, 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 survey takers were asked, uh, were presented with these directions. In this part of the survey, you're going to be presented with six student academic snapshots. For each profile, you'll be asked to evaluate whether or not you would recommend the student to take an advanced placement calculus course. And then we also said brief comments from each student's math teachers are included in the profile. Once you complete the recommendation for a profile, you will not be able to go back and alter that recommendation. Okay, and then we gave them six profiles, six academic snapshots. Um, the first two were the same for all of the counselors. Um, this was sort of our baseline, so we can just get a sense of whether or not, um, uh, you know, counselors were easy raters or more difficult raters, um, and that was a control we can use. Um, and then after that, they received a randomization into um, um, either receiving transcripts that had um, that were uh, completely blinded, so no identifying information, all the identif identifying information was blacked out, um, and then transcripts that had a, a mix of um, uh, uh, black, white, male, or female name identifiers. Okay. Um, so here's an example of what a transcript might look like. Um, the writing's very small, so I'll orient you to, to what we were doing. But student information would be at the top. This is um, you know, sort of a typical um, standard uh, transcript. Um, we vetted these transcripts with uh, school counselors in the field um, and uh, uh, to make sure that they were accurate. Um, the GPAs are accurately calculated based on the, um, the grades and the um, whether or not they're taking honors and so on. And so what we show is um, ninth grade, 10th grade and 11th grade performance, past performance. And then we say, you know, what do you think should this student, you know, take AP calculus in the 12th grade is what we're asking the counselors to, to think about. And um, the math comments that we, um, the behavioral treatment that we also include will be, um, you know, brief comments about how they do. So these are standard sort of stock comments that are found in transcripts like diligent worker, right? Completes all assignments is given, asks questions and participates regularly, okay? And let's see. And then after seeing the transcript, they're just asked two questions. Would you recommend this student for advanced placement calculus course? Yes or no? And then on a scale of zero to 10, how prepared would you say this student is for an advanced placement calculus course? And we included this because we had some indication that some school counselors might say anybody who wants to take an AP course should be allowed. So yes, I say anybody, right? But we also wanted to get a sense then, okay, even if you think anybody should be allowed, how prepared do you think this particular student is? Okay. Let me see. So um, what I'm showing you here now are um, the names um, that we uh, that we ended up choosing um, to be indicative of either um, black, white, male, or female students. Um, we vetted these names using Amazon MTurk um, and asked, you know, and just to make sure that they were signifying what we thought they were signifying. Yes, question. Yeah, thanks. No, I was just curious when you when you go through the resumes, are there a certain number of 
var variants or permutations of the of the resume? So, or is it all one resume and you just vary the name? That's a great question. There's um, there are multiple um, uh, transcripts, and so what we what we did is we we have four four variants. Um, and they're actually part of the, the treatment. So we, we have a strong transcript, um, strong academic transcript and a borderline academic transcript. I'm gonna show you the examples of both of them. Um, and then a strong behavioral um, transcript and borderline behavioral transcript. And we, so that creates four, right? Strong, 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 borderline, borderline, strong and borderline, borderline with the two. Okay, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I had just a yes. real quick question about the transcripts as well. Yes. Um, were the, the high school names, were those made up as well or were those like real high schools? So we just, we only used one high school um, and it was made up, right? So, okay. so this is definitely not a, it's not, and there are other um, aspects that create, um, that I would say are limitations of the study that are, you know, make it so that it is, you know, not as realistic, right, uh, a setting as, as, as we would like, but, but certainly that. And, you know, another thing is that, you know, most um, school counselors would recognize um, um, that, that we're not showing them actual, we didn't say we were showing them actual transcripts, right? We just okay. said we're interested in, you know, we're interested, how we set it up was we said we're interested in understanding more about the, um, um, recommendation process for advanced placement courses. Could you look at these transcripts and um, tell us what you think? Um, okay. Because most, yeah, most um, uh, school counselors would be like, "Hey, these are like um, FERPA violations for you to be showing us the students' <laughs> names and the right." So, so you know, certainly. Well, and I guess like my train of thought with that was more the concern of even if you blacked out like the 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 children's names, if they knew that particular high school was in. A predominantly black area versus a predominantly white area that you know even that's not right. having the name their assumptions could be made that's right no you're, you're exactly right with that and i am going to talk um um towards the end uh about this we envisioned this project as a pilot project for a larger project that we were doing um and so we learned a lot in this project um uh, we're happy that this uh got published um but we also learned a lot uh, of how to improve upon it and one of the things will be to um, um, be able to link the school counselor uh, who's taking the survey um, link and de-identify them with their NCES school ID so that we can get data on their own school right so 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 that it's operating in the they're operating in a context of a specific school in their minds right and so if they are themselves in a high minority school what does that mean versus if they're in a school that's you know predominantly white and so on so we will be able to do more of that, but that's, so that's a great question because context matters, right? It does. Um, okay, so I should say that the, um, the only um, uh, potential issue we had was that only about 80% of our Amazon inter MTurk um, respondents thought Deja was a uh, female name. And so we wanted to make sure that it got to, you know, 100%. Um, um, or close. So we also just included in the behavioral prompts, um, uh, gender pronouns. So always puts forth her best effort or something just to make sure that um, um, it was clear and we got higher than this 80%. Um, okay. The other thing that we um, were, you know, were made aware of um, after we implemented our um, initial uh, study, we did this in the summer of 2016, um, collecting the data, um, was this excellent paper by um, Gaddis, a uh, sociologist who um, looks at the uh, socioeconomic status signif signifying of names. So he's saying, it's great that all of you are doing these audit, audit studies. You need to take into account that your names are also signifying socioeconomic status. Um, and not just um, race or gender. And to some extent we did that um, um, in asking our MTurk um, uh, respondents uh, a question about the, um, you know, the income background, what do you think the income background of the, this person is? And um, the only name that stood out as re respondents thinking it came from uh, uh, the name uh, was it from a person who came from a lower income background would be DeAndre Washington. So we will have some complications with socioeconomic status um, in our results in that 
um, people were more likely to view this black male name as also being possibly socioeconomically disadvantaged. Okay. Um, but going forward, um, what we're doing in our project that's that's going forward, our our our, our larger national project is um, choosing names that um, uh, have also been vetted um, uh, socioeconomic at socioeconomic status levels. Um, and so for example, Janae, Jabari, Jada, and Darius are higher within SES names for um, uh, the uh, black name category. Ashanti and Kevan are sort of mid SES range and Tamika and Deshaun lower SES. And similarly for you know, Madeline Spencer, uh, Cassie, Cody, Carey, and Scott, and then Melanie and Edwin. Um, and so we'll, we'll implement that um, by being able to then control for on the back end um, uh, socioeconomic status signifying as well. Sorry, the dog. Um, okay, so, and this is an example of what it would look like when the information was um, blinded, um, uh, when we blacked out the student information. And so uh, this, you know, same transcript, but um, blacked out information. Okay, so our participants, we, we implemented our, our, our study at a conference for um, uh, school counselors. And um, just to give you a sense of how we compared nationally, um, the school counselor field is um, a predominantly female field uh, to begin with, and our sample was even more so. Um, uh, we were, you know, slightly um, overrepresented by um, Black school counselors taking our survey relative to their national representation, and um, slightly underrepresented with white school counselors. Um, similarly represented with um, those who identify as Hispanic, and then because of the location of the conference, we sort of skewed to being represented by school counselors who came from the South and the West. Um, as opposed to the Northeast or Midwest, just to give you a, a sense. It's not nationally represented. Um, um, and we hope to do a, a national survey um, going forward. Okay, so our treatments. Um, uh, strong academic, strong behavior. Uh, oh, so this is important. Um, I will just say for the randomization. Um, uh, okay, so after the first two transcripts, um, uh, uh, Participants were randomly presented um, one of the four um, transcript types, the strong, strong, um, so on and so forth, and randomly um, had a name attached to that that could have been the black male name, um, the black female name, the white male name, or the white female name, okay? Uh, we do have, um, we have had recommendations for a stronger randomization um, uh, techniques going forward, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, uh, towards the end as well. Okay, so our strong academic, strong behavior transcript uh, looks like this. This is the blinded version, but you can see this is, you know, high GPAs. It's above 4.0 because the student has taken honors and AP courses and um, in the sort of U.S. high school GPA schema. Um, you get even more credit, more points. You get five out of four points for taking um, an AP class, for example. Um, so uh, high GPAs, um, A's and B's, um, the behavioral comments are positive, a pleasure to have in class. Um, it says puts forth best, best effort for the female transcript. It would say puts forth her best effort for the male. It would say puts forth his best efforts and then always stays on task. And so now what I'm showing you is for the blinded transcript, um, those, those who received the blinded transcript, 100% of those who received the blinded transcript uh, were likely to recommend that transcript for advanced placement calculus. And on the preparedness scale, um, there was a mean of 8.3 um, and not a lot of dispersion. Most school counselors thought this was a very prepared transcript. It's meant to be strong. It's meant to be a slam dunk. And it is. And so when we look at the results by race and gender, so what we see is that black males, white males, and white females were 100% likely to be recommended, but the black, fe the, the black female transcript was only 79.4% likely to be recommended. And this is the same strong transcript. 
Um, and that even bears out in, um, you know, it's not a fluke of the um, recommendation, it even bears out in how prepared counselors say this student is. Whereas the others were in the 8.7, 8.4 range, um, the transcript with the black female name was seen as being only mm, about 6.9% likely to be prepared, right? And this is the slam dunk strong transcript I just showed you that, um, you know, most people would say is definitely prepared for advanced placement calculus. We were surprised to see um, in our results this show up in the strongest transcript. We, our hypothesis was that it would show up more in the borderline transcript where you have to make more of a gut call and where some of that subjectivity is more likely to be um, influenced by you know, bias, whether implicit or otherwise. Um, and so um, the fact that it shows up in the strongest transcript um, um, was also um, uh, very interesting. When we look at the borderline, um, borderline academics and strong behavior, so this is a transcript where it's still not a bad transcript, right? This student is still has a 3.7 GPA, right? 3.76, 3.78. They're still taking some honors courses. Um, um, they're still getting decent grades. It just wasn't as slam dunk as the first transcript. Right, so um, so there's just you know it's 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 borderline for AP, right? It's not like a borderline student, right? Um, so it's still a, a good transcript. What we see is, as we would expect, because it isn't as strong as the first one, um, this transcript is less likely to be recommended um, than the hundred percent threshold, but still highly likely to be recommended for AP. But now there's a little bit more um, uh, uh, dispersion in how prepared school counselors thought this transcript is. And when we look at the race and gender results, um, what we see is there's no significant differences between um, uh, the, um, the transcripts, um, but what we might see is suggestive evidence that um, the male transcripts are slightly more likely to be recommended than the female transcripts. Um, again, this is not significant, but I, so I say suggestive and something that we'd wanna see um, if it holds up in the larger uh, national study um, uh, because this is particularly interesting when also paired with the suggestive evidence that on the transcript that's um, borderline behavior but strong academics, I'm gonna skip forward a little and show you that the male students are suggestively less likely to be recommended, right? So, so when it comes to behavior, if the behavior is borderline, it's possible that um, uh, the male students are less likely to be recommended. But if the academics are borderline, it's suggestive that the female students are less likely to be recommended. Um, this falls in line with some of what we know to be some of the, um, um, typical uh, gender stereotypes in academic settings around math, right? If girls are um, uh, stereotyped to be uh, um, to, to, to be not as good as math, and then you pair that with this sort of borderline academics, it maybe confirms right your prior and tells you, yeah, I don't think this student maybe is a, is, is is ready, right? Um, and if your prior is that um, you know boys um, in academic settings tend to uh, um, uh, uh, have you know worse behavior or these non-cognitive traits than girls in academic settings, um, and you see that uh, borne out in the uh, in the transcript with the sorry I should have shown you I skipped through it with the um, borderline behavior right easily distracted doesn't always put forth best effort right the borderline behavior that's confirming your prior and maybe making you less likely to recommend the male transcript. But again, these are um, suggestive. And then the final transcript um, is the borderline borderline, where there's both um, the borderline academics paired with the borderline um, behavioral cues. And what we end up seeing is that, yes, this is the least likely to be recommended. Um, this is the blinded version again, I'm showing you. And it has um, you know, one of the lowest preparedness ratings you know, much more dispersion. Um, and when we look at the race and gender combinations, we again see that um, the black female transcript is uh, significantly less likely to be recommended. 
um, and has a, a lower mean score. Um, but we also see this result now that the white male transcript is also less likely um, than the blinded transcript to be recommended and also has a low preparedness score. And so one of the things that um, uh, we propose as an explanation for that is um, expectations uh, for white males in the classroom are um, uh, much higher, right? There's documented evidence that teachers have higher expectations of performance for white males. And, um, and so those high expectations paired with this marginal transcript, right? Makes them say, oh no, this is a student that's, that is not prepared, right? And so that's our, that's our hypothesis. Um, I'm open to, to hearing other um, thoughts. Um, and so I will just say that um, I was showing you the um, sort of raw percentages. We also um, um, estimated the likelihood of recommendation um, for each transcript name as a function of, um, um, I'm sorry, controlling for um, counselor, the counselor demographics, um, demographics of the counselors who took the survey. Um, and also um, the um, uh, controlling for the ratings of those first two transcripts, um, the baseline transcripts, so that we, um, we can uh, control for any possible um, non-randomization, um, even though uh, we believe our randomization was good. Um, and the results are, are uh, bear out, right? So this is the black female transcript again being much less likely than the blinded transcript, which is the um, red line uh, to be recommended in the strong, strong. And then we see the results for the black female and white male in the um, borderline, borderline in likelihood of being recommended. Um, and similarly for the um, uh, preparedness ratings. So, um, what were our takeaways that black female students are less likely to be recommended for AP Calc um, and are rated as being less prepared even when they have strong academic and behavioral records, right? So that this represents an additional barrier. Um, that transcript, that very strong transcript is um, indicative of a student who's quote unquote, like I said, doing all the right things, right? Um, and yet there's still um, an additional hur hurdle of their school counselor possibly not being supportive of them taking um, this important gateway, gateway course, um, gateway to STEM fields. Um, again, I said we had su some suggestive evidence that female students are penalized for having borderline academics, while male students are penalized for having borderline behavior. Um, and then we saw the result that both white male students and black female students are less likely to be recommended if they have borderline academic and behavioral records. And so that's, um, that is the end of this paper. I am happy to um, take questions, but also to, to share with you some of, the, um, uh, some of the things we're hoping to do with the larger national study and get some of your maybe um, pre-implementation feedback on that so we can make it uh, better before, it, before we even do it, right? That'd be great. I'd love to hear about the Excellent. plans moving so, forward. Yeah. Thanks, Alyssa. So, um, so one of the things that we're going to do, um, that we're going to investigate in the larger study, um, comes from having presented this study. You know, lots of people have asked, well, but you know, do you think it's statistical discrimination? So, me, I think, yeah, my personal opinion is that discrimination is discrimination, and you know, whether the sources, um, you know, what we economists want to name statistical discrimination doesn't matter, but um, I think it is an interesting research question. And so, um, um, right, so, you know, the idea with the statistical discrimination is that in the face of imperfect information about an individual student's potential, a school counselor may ascribe group averages to that individual. Therefore, if their prior is that black female students are less successful in AP calculus on average, it's rational for them to ascribe, to ascribe that subpar level of success to individual black female students, okay? And so, um, you know, one of the things that we hit on then is, um, well, let's give a random um, subset of the participants in our larger national study more information, 
So in addition to the transcript, um, we'll also include for a random subset, this PSAT score, um, we'll say the student's PSAT score is 750, that's the 99th percentile. And then we'll also make it visual and obvious, right? Green, happy, close to the, the max. Um, so that it's really an additional set of information that says this is a strong student. Um, and, you know, see to the extent that that um, uh, 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 lessens bias, uh, maybe that's evidence that some of the um, discrimination that's happening um, can be thought of as statistical discrimination. Um, but if those school counselors that receive this additional information um, among that subset of school counselors, if the um, uh, level of bias looks similar to those um, that have not, um, then it would be evidence maybe that it, the discrimination is not necessarily statistical in nature. And the other thing we wanted, to, yes, question about that. Oh, not about that, no, finish that. Oh, okay. It's a totally different question. Okay. Um, okay, I finished that thought. Um, we were going to do some other things like also um, richer demographic, um, uh, a richer set of demographic um, information from the school counselors, um, along with being able again to pair them with their school context. Um, uh, and then also doing an implicit associations test um, to get at the question of is this bias um, implicit? Um, and I'll talk, I'll skip this a little bit just to, we'll go back. And then also doing a good old fashioned racial attitude scale um, to look at uh, uh, taste-based discrimination as well. So trying to tease out um, if we do continue to see bias in the larger national sample, what is the source, right? What, are, what do we think the source of the bias is? That's it, I'll stop there. So my, my question was very similar to maybe maybe your uh, what you just said. I was I was partly curious if if you would observe different racial biases in counselors from predominantly white schools versus less predominantly white schools or or the like. And I guess that's that's part of the demographic. That's right. So it's part of the demographics, but also um, really what we what we were missing and what we do need to do and, and will be able to do in the larger study is match them right with their with their school um, uh, characteristics. And so um, and to be able to say something, um, um, maybe do some um, um, uh, subsample analysis counselors that are in predominantly black schools or um, you know, counselors that are in predominantly white schools and, and seeing um, um, what shakes out there. Um, but also um, with the demographic information, um, uh, getting a richer sense of um, uh, what we asked in this, um, in the current study, the pilot study was um, gender identity, um, race and ethnicity, um, uh, experience um, in the field, and, and that was about it, right? Um, so it would be interesting to get, um, you know, much more uh, uh, detailed demographic information on the, on the participants themselves. Let's see, there is a, there's questions in the chat. Um, I'll do this one. So can you ask about AP Calculus and AP English to try to distinguish outcomes between STEM and non-STEM courses? That's a good question. And so, you know, one of the, one of the reasons we chose AP Calculus was obviously for the, the one I talked about, um, this, you know, gateway to STEM courses, but also, um, you know, math um, is more, um, math education in the U.S. is more sequential in nature and in a way where it was, it's easier to set somebody up as being in, in the transcript, right, set them up as being, you know, prepared to take this. Um, I think AP English you can take um, right as early as tenth grade, right? You can be you're, you're you are. It's harder to signal eligibility um, for AP English, and I wonder that if we get more fuzziness, is it just because it's um, uh, uh, is it just because it was harder for us to signal? Um, so I don't know, right? I don't, I don't know um, what people think about that. And you know, even similarly for like 
you know, um, AP Spanish, right? Some, um, uh, some people can take AP Spanish as early as ninth grade, right? So it's harder to, to say, oh, this student, I can demonstrate to you in this transcript that this student is, is possibly ready to take it. So that was, that's part of the reason. Um, let's see. Uh, and there was an earlier question about whether there's evidence of both cultural and structural. Yeah, right. I mean, so, so um, um, I, I think that a lot of times in the literature, um, it, you know, there seem to be camps, right, of cultural explanations and structural explanations. And in reality, um, some things are much, you know, more gray than that, right? That, um, uh, that I think that, um, uh, and I think you're right, right? That, that, that it doesn't have to be this stark divide. Um, um, and I will say that I'm not a, a opposed to mentoring programs. I think mentoring programs are great. I'm just opposed to them as being the only solution for academic achievement gaps, right? That, um, so I think that there's, there's certainly room um, um, for, for, for that gray area. Yes, Tasha, did you want to explain? Joshua, is that? You might be on mute. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I, I guess my speaker doesn't work when my camera's off. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, with my question, I guess I was curious about the interaction of the two. And is there some way that you can tease that out? Because, you know, um, just practically speaking, we know that there's, there's both, both going to be cultural and structural issues that interact with each other in there. And it seems like you're your next study kind of gets at that a little bit more, this idea of trying to tease out some other factors that might might add some noise to, to the, the structural component. And I, I guess I was just wondering if you could talk to that a little bit, this idea of how do you separate out cultural factors from structural? Does yeah, I think, yeah, no, it does, it makes sense. Um, so I think I have a, I have another paper um, that, that, that speaks to that a little bit and also the work of um, um, Carolyn Tyson um, a sociologist out of um, uh, UNC, she, her book, uh, Racialized Tracking, or I'm sorry, Integration Interrupted, um, um, where she does go, go around and ask high school students, black students, right? Like, why aren't you taking AP courses, right? Or why aren't you taking advanced courses? And, um, and you know, she, she finds that um, uh, black students are much more likely to point to a fear of failure, fear, fear of failing those courses, um, um, than, you know, anybody telling them, you know, their peers telling them they're acting white. So, so she found that it was less likely that there was this cultural acting white oppositional culture thing going on and more likely that there's this fear failure thing going on. But to your point, she did find that in schools where there is a visual racial divide, where there's um, um, uh, predominantly white students taking the advanced courses um, and black students in lower level courses, um, schools that are racially diverse and there is this visual, visual divide, those were the places where she did find some students say that they, there was this fear of being called acting white. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, to that extent, that is where structure is somewhat combining with this um, culture. So, so those schools are, are spaces where there was this, you know, historical racialized tracking, which I would call structure. Right, that may be contributing to this potential um, uh, cultural response. Interesting. And I had a slightly separate question while I have you as well. How do you, did you have any concern or how do you deal with any sort of Hawthorne effects? You know, the fact that someone thinks that they're being experimented on and so that they, have, they want to respond in a socially desirable way? Yes. So one of the interesting things is that this particular school counselor conference, there's multiple school counselor conference, just like there's multiple economist conference. This one was particularly social justice oriented. And so we thought, oh, we're gonna do it here. We may not find anything, right? Like, so if these are, you know, particular school counselors that are attuned to this um, and, you know, um, working on, you know, decreasing bias and things like that, maybe we won't find anything. So the fact that this, you know, these results appeared even among this sample of school counselors that particularly um, attend this conference because they're interested in social justice issues made us think, wow, what, what are we going to see in the larger national sample? Um, and so, so, you know, to your point, um, that's right. These are, this is a, it's an experimental environment. It's not a real, um, it's not a real environment. 
Um, and so what, what we think is that we may have an, um, um, sort of lower bound on the amount of bias we might observe in the, in the real world. Thank you. Related to that, you, you, you also, you do find, it seems that across most of your categories that black males are more likely to be recommended than white males marginally, but, but the, I mean, that could be a Hawthorne effect. That's right. And that's, and, 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 and so I, I said, I would speak to it later and then I didn't. Um, that's part of what we were thinking might be happening with this DeAndre also being viewed as being from a low socioeconomic status background mm -hmm. that these counselors were saying in particular, oh, this is a student who's particularly disadvantaged. Look how well he seems to be doing. Yes, he should be in, in AP Calc, right? So. Alyssa, you had a question. Was that part? Of I did. Um, it was that I was asking about the. I was going to ask about that Hawthorne effect kind of thing, you know. Uh, but it's interesting. It's a really interesting point that you were at this social justice conference and you still, you know, uh, teased out these these differences. Um, so how are you? So I then I have a question about how are you going to administer the surveys for the national sample. So that's one question. And then the second is you talked about the uh, gender and race ethnicity distribution of the respondents at the beginning um, of the presentation. And I know you didn't have very many in a number of the categories. So I was wondering if you looked at that at all in terms of how that affected people's responses. And obviously that's something you'll do in the national survey too, it looks like based on okay. All of the additional data, yeah, that's right. So we'll definitely do it in the in the in the national um, survey when hopefully we can get larger bin sizes, right? Um, mm -hmm. But um, we did not have enough, right? For for eight what eighty six percent to be women, you know, we couldn't do something separate by, um, you know, separating gender. We did say let's just look at. Um, uh, the female respondents, and uh, there was not a lot of difference. Um, similarly, we said, let's just look at um, white respondents um, or even the white female respondents and um, didn't see a, 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 lot, of, a lot of difference um, from, the main, from the main results. Um, but it is something we'll, we'll be more attuned to in the larger sample. Um, I should mm -hmm. also say in the larger sample, we're going to be able to um, um, implement a, a better variety um, where it comes to um, race and ethnicity. So we'll incorporate um, Hispanic surnames um, and then we'll also, um, we've identified um, uh, um, some uh, Asian uh, surnames that we'll, we'll use. That took a lot of um, uh, debate and discussion and, and thinking through um, right, because certainly um, the Asian American community is not a monolith, and 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 we said, you know, should we have a, um, a, a Japanese identified surname? Mm -hmm. Should we have a, mm -hmm. right? Like so, so and some of those things I think we're still thinking through. Um, but we would um, um, implement uh, um, those surveys more um, uh, surveys that included uh, treatments with. Um, um, Asian uh, surnames in uh, the Pacific Northwest in California, right, where there's have more um, uh, a larger um, Asian population. Um, um, and how are we doing it? You asked that. So we, um, it would be uh, administered online through Qualtrics. That's how we set up the initial um, survey anyway, even though we were in person. Um, school counselors took the survey on Qualtrics on iPads. And mm -hmm. so, um, so we, uh, set, we will set up the, the um, uh, survey, recruit. Our initial uh, plan was to recruit school counselors um, uh, via email. Um, and we had um, an RA who got us the um, school administrator contact information for um, all uh, high schools, public high schools in um, 38 states, um, mm -hmm. and then coronavirus, right? And then we <laughs> said, oh, this would really kind of mess up external validity to be asking them this in this sort of crazy environment and they're not even, right? I don't know. So, so we decided yeah. 
to, to put a hold on that and that really put a wrench in the works. Um, and so it was kind of on hold. And then obviously while that happened, our administrator contact database is quickly becoming old and outdated. And, um, but luckily there is a, there is a good <laughs> ending. I now have a, um, uh, a contact who um, is connecting us with the superintendents association Mm -hmm. um and who's interested in um you know research like this and so um that will be our recruitment um uh vehicle to go through and you know um have the endorsement and support of um superintendents to try to get um counselors to participate um but yeah so there's been a wrench this is right like something we're eager to get done but um uh it's one of the things that that we ended up having to put on hold uh, this is slightly tangential to your research project here, but but related to your motivation at the beginning, you were you were showing that um, you know the stark differences in completion of AP calculus or whatever across racial groups, and I, I'm just wondering how much of that is really happening in high school versus before. So I, I mean, when I went through it, I remember as early as eighth grade, you you sort of selected into into algebra or something. It was like high school algebra. And I would guess the same students who took high school algebra were largely the same students who took AP calculus in high school. So I wonder how much of a history dependence there is and path dependency and where it starts and where it's most influential. I don't know if you have any, right. any information about that. I do. No, you're exactly right, right? That, that, that these things happen um, early, um, right? There's even um, uh, legislation in, in, in some states, North Carolina included, that you know tried to um, make eighth grade algebra um, mandatory, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the downfall with that is that they, I think, they did that without enough support for students who are not ready for eighth grade algebra, right? And so you see a lot of um, failure. But um, but that's right. Like if you if you have not taken algebra in the eighth grade, you are less likely to be on this college ready um, path. Um, and so, and so that's why there's certainly been um, um, a push to look at at eighth grade algebra, um, and um, it goes back even you know before that, right? Um, you know, there's the the separation into gifted and talented education as early as the third grade, um, and and so on. And so, um, um, you know, one of the things that I, I think you're right to point out is that there's a whole population of students who are ineligible before they you know, even arrive on, on, on at, at high school, right? On the doorstep. Um, and so it's even you know, kind of you know, more surprising, um, I think that we, when we do see um, students who are academically eligible, and this is, um, um, I have another paper with Sandy Darity where we, look at this empirically at using North Carolina data and show that even students who are academically eligible, um, uh, black students are less likely to opt into um, uh, these AP courses, particularly AP calculus. Um, and in that paper that I have, we, we show that um, uh, it's related to the percentage of black students who are in it um, the cohorts before you, right? So if I land on the ninth grade and I can see who's going to what courses and I see there's not really any black students in the AP, the AP courses, I'm less likely to take them. And so we say in that way, you know, these racialized tracking, it can support itself, even in the absence of explicit, you know, discrimination or, or anything like that. It's sort of self-perpetuating um, unless there's this intervention that, that stops it. Um, and I should say that paper, it's called um, uh, Separate and Unequal Under One Roof. It was just published this February, um, a couple of months ago in Russell Sage Journal with Sandy. Um, I have another question in the chat. So I see, let's see. Related to the question of math tracks, what would the alternative to AP Calc be for a student who has already taken pre-calc? Um, are there schools offering a basic calc for 12th graders or does that halt their math progress until college if they aren't recommended for AP calc? That's right. So there is, there, there's, there's um, a couple of decisions, right? There is um, um, calculus that maybe is not advanced placement. Um, um, even within the advanced placement calculus, there's 
AP, there's advanced placement calc AB, and then there's BC, which is even right another level. And um, um, female students are much less likely to be seen in BC than they are in AB. So that's even another um, um, issue. Um, but, and then there's also, um, uh, if you've met your math requirements um, uh, for graduation, right? You can take something else, right? So some students will just, you're right, just say, okay, great. I've done all the math that I'm supposed to for graduation. Um, I guess I'll take, you know, some other course. So um, um, that's right. And, and all of those, like those things do set you back if you then get to college and say, oh no, I do want to do something like engineering, right? Like I do want to do something that's more STEM related. Now you've got to go and, and um, you know, backtrack and, and, and do this calculus in college. So I had a quick question kind of along these same lines of the different tracks and stuff that you can take. Um, if you are a student that has this, you know, that falls into the, the strong, strong category, but you aren't recommended for the AP course, what's, what are the avenues to fight that? That's because that, 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 that's another barrier too, right? Some people don't want to fight. Some people will okay. fight it. So I'm just kind of like, I know nothing about AP courses. I never took them. I never qualified for them. I know nothing about them. <laughs> so I don't know yeah. what the, what, what the process would be if you were like, no, I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. And I want to fight this decision. Yeah. So there's, um, so, so one important thing to note, and I'm glad you, you, you brought this up is that this, these things operate differently um, across schools, right? There could be, you know, two high schools in the same district where, where it can operate differently. Um, and so um, in some places, the school counselor is, you know, is an actual barrier, right? Um, but in other places, it's really, it's up to the student and their parents, right, to select into it. Um, and um, the school counselor is not serving as this formal barrier. But there's an interesting paper by um, Yonazawa and co-authors that um, it's a qualitative paper where um, they detail all of the ways that um, minoritized students are either um, less likely to be encouraged to, to, to take these courses and more likely to be um, subtly discouraged or blatantly discouraged from taking them. So even when the school counselor is not an actual you know, um, uh, requirement to get their permission, um, um, we see that they do, they do form an important um, component in um, encouraging some students and, and not others. Um, and you're right, there's also, you know, you can say, um, well, it's a student's choice and it's the student and the parent's choice, right? They should just, they should just demand it, right? And it's easy to, to tell people that, but again, we know that um, um, uh, you are less likely to feel agency in um, sort of institutional environments um, like schools when you're from a minoritized background as well. So that makes some sense. These are excellent questions. Thank you. <laughs>